Father, we thank you for the day you've given us, for the blessed assurance that we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for the epistle to Philemon, and may it be, as it were, the epistle to each one of us today as we glean from these verses that which you would have implemented in our hearts and lives. And for this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, the book of Philemon. And we started a little bit in this last time, but so we will start with verse 1 and read those early verses and get to where we left off. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, a slave, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother. So Paul and Timothy were sending this in some sense together. To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. We think, I don't know that, I don't believe that Timothy was in prison, but Paul was, probably his Roman imprisoner. And, but he says, I'm a prisoner of Christ. And so uh, all of us have something that we feel like we're chained to that we'd like to get rid of. And may we see beyond it to see that if we have it, God is at work. It came through God's screen. Now, if, it's some, if we're having it because of our sin, then we need to repent. And we still may have the consequences. But um, it's very encouraging and freeing of the things in our world that we cannot change to view it, I'm here to be the Lord's servant. I'm here to serve the Lord. That's all that matters. So, uh, this is going to be a letter in which he appeals to his friend Philemon about a slave, Onesimus, that Paul has met some way or another in prison. And now he was, he was uh, uh, not actually in a, a jail at this point, but he was... Uh, yeah, under home arrest, you might say. So he had some free to, freedom to get around. And so in some way or another, he met Onesimus and shared the gospel with him. Onesimus is now a believer. And as Paul often did, he referred to those that he had the privilege of leading to Christ as his children. So he says I th in verse... 4 through 7, I thank my God, making mention of you always in my prayers, hearing of your love and faith, which you have toward the Lord Jesus Christ and toward all saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good work which is in you in Christ Jesus. For we have great joy and consolation in your love because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So Philemon uh, was a wonderful servant of the Lord, uh, very ministry-oriented, um, using his heart and life and his gifts and talents to be a blessing to others. So Paul said, I make mention of you in prayers. What do you think we can glean from just that phrase? He uses it several times in Romans, Ephesians, uh, Thessalonians, and Philemon. I make mention of you in prayers. He just, this, this is, gives scriptural warrant to brief holy telegrams to God. Well, I'm not really praying unless I pray this long prayer. Or I don't feel like I'm much of a... Uh, prayer warrior because I can't pray like so and so. They just go on and on and on and I don't feel like I can do that. I'm sure there were times when the Apostle Paul had long seasons of prayer. But there is great power and great usefulness in just making mention to, some, uh, to the Lord of someone in prayer. 
And you can do that wherever you're going. Something will come across your plate. You'll see someone, and there'll be a quickening of the Spirit of God. Lift them before the throne of grace. That, that's the, that's the, what, what I want us to glean from that. So, uh, hearing of your love and faith, a number of the, apo- uh, the, uh, the apostles' epistles, you look in the first chapter and you can circle, he makes mention of love, faith, and hope. doesn't mention hope here. But those are three key issues uh, in the Christian life to be developing and to be uh, focusing on. Uh, our trust in the Lord, uh, the outflowing of our faith in ministry to others in love, and having a confidence that the best is yet to be for the child of God. Uh, Fleeman was sharing his faith. There was an overflow of his relationship with God, prompted by faith, that flowed into the lives of others. Some of you will uh, know that very often in the New Testament, the word sharing or fellowship is, I've heard it's pronounced several different ways, koinonia, uh, or koinonia, whichever you want to use. But it's works of charity, works of love that he is carrying out on behalf of the saints. Put Galatians 6.10 by this. Because there we're told, do good to all men, but especially to the household of faith. Now, there is a tendency... Uh, in our modern era to do good works uh, a lot of mission trips are f- will focus on going somewhere where the people are poor uh, building a building, repairing a building uh, doing this sort of just hands on carpentry, whatever nothing wrong with that but what happens many times is that various and sundry good deeds become the issue and the gospel gets put in the background. They really ought to go hand in hand as a Christian. The the good deeds can open the door for the gospel. But we need to be careful not to separate them. Um, I hope that you can say with Paul that you've been refreshed by some brothers and sisters. And, and I hope that just from what the, here, here's the Apostle Paul, I mean he he's not some little weak Christian. Uh, he's a warrior. I mean he's seasoned. He's strong in the Lord. And you say well he probably doesn't need anybody. He asked for prayers in other places. Uh, he, was, he, he was a man, he was a human, and he was not one that did not need others. And so he was refreshed and built up by his fellowship with others. And so that should remind us of Ephesians 4, about verse, hmm, didn't plan on this, but toward the end of the chapter that we're built up by that which every joint supplies. That's God's economy for us. And so we live in a culture where we live separate, uh, all over creation. Work takes a lot of different directions. And we have to make a choice to live in in, in fellowship. Um, We call this uh, Saturday morning men's fellowship and Bible study. And we open the doors at 7.30 and we hope that you'll come in and fellowship or maybe linger afterwards and fellowship. There is a sense of fellowship when we study together. uh, That you'll discover some ways in which you can pray for each other in the coming week. Or maybe something you can do on behalf of a brother. Or or make mention that something will be said or done as you you learn what this brother is facing the coming week, and you may be driving along at work, and, and the Spirit of God quickens you to make mention of this brother in prayer. 
So the, just a lot of practical things that can come out of this for us. All right, verse 8 through 11. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you. This is the New King James, incidentally. Being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is, prof is profitable to you and to me. So Paul is going to ask for a favor. Uh, he's the Apostle Paul. Uh, he could have commanded. Uh, he had a good relationship with Philemon, but he could have said just right up front, you know, I'm the apostle. God has spoken to me. Uh, God has told me to tell you to do this. Uh, but even as the apostle, and he had more of a right to give a command than you and I do, uh, his method here was to make an appeal based on reminding Philemon of how gracious God had already been to him. And uh, whether it's in your family or wherever, this is, this is a great way to go. Does that mean that there's no place to just outright give a command if you are in a place of servant leadership? No, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4 through 5, for example, uh, Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and they have a guy there that is uh, living with his mother sexually, and uh, I believe that was the case, something pervert. His, his dad's wife, yeah. May or may not have been his mother. You shouldn't go to things without having read them first. <laughs> well, it was immoral, grossly immoral. And the church was doing nothing about it. And so Paul gave a strong command, deal with this. And, and there's a time and place for this. Now... It could be a work situation and, and your supervisor comes or uh, it could be in a church and most of us don't like people giving us a command. And we can be really sensitive about this. But very, uh, it's a wonderful day when we can be humble and receive a command. Even if it's not done in the best spirit, we know it's needed. We know it's something that should be done. And so instead of coming back in our spirit or coming back verbally and criticizing how it was done, well, you know, this is, it was right, so I'm going to do it as an act of worship to the Lord. So, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. Uh, I don't really know fully why Paul said, I'm old and a prisoner. I don't believe he's just trying to get human sympathy. Uh, and yet, uh, he, he, does, he says, I want to tell you what I need from you. And Philemon could be all caught up in other things, and it would be good for him to remember, okay. Uh, the Apostle Paul is old. Uh, he is a prisoner. And that's a part of the real world. And uh, now sometimes, again, why we should not be quick in our judgment is people are having stuff that we don't know that they're having. And they make a request to us, and we say, well, why don't you do it yourself? Well, sometimes we need to say that. But uh, it's good to uh, walk in the light with each other and have respect for someone 
because they're old. Right, Leo? Yeah. <laughs> I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my chains. So, Onesimus had escaped, and he went to the big city. That's what people still do. They escape, and they go hide in the big city. And in the providence of God, he encounters the Apostle Paul, and God saved him. And didn't just merely lead him through a prayer, but they entered into discipleship, and Onesimus, with a new heart, became very uh, a strong blessing to the Apostle Paul. I hope you've had the experience of investing your life in someone and then later on finding them to be a blessing to you. Uh, and even if it doesn't turn out to be as strong a relationship as with Onesimus to Philemon, uh, if in 1 John, or it may be 3 John, I rejoice when I see my children doing well. Uh, the paraphrase of it. But here's, uh, here's a, a part of the tradition of that time. Uh, the the uh, Romans had been influenced by the Greeks before them, and the, a part of what would happen is an escaped prisoner or escaped uh, slave could, could go to a sanctuary and it could be someone's home or an individual. And so then the, the, um, the family who is a sanctuary family would give the slave protection while they, while they try to persuade him to return to his master. They might give him protection and guard him, for that matter. Now, if, if the slave did not, was not willing to go back to the master, then the, uh, the sanctuary family would put the slave up for auction and give the price of the slave to the former master. Now, that would be a normal thing. Don't know that always happened, but history tells us that was a normal practice. So, in this case, uh, Paul gave Onesimus protection, and now he is working with Philemon, the rightful owner, to bring about a solution. So he speaks of him as my son. My, uh, he did that of Timothy, Titus, some of the Corinthians, some of the Galatians his children in the Lord. And so he says, he's very honest about this. He says, I know that he was unprofitable to you. So that tells you that uh, Onesimus was honest with the Apostle Paul about the way he had been. He's now profitable to me. And uh, by the way, the word Onesimus has in its root background one that is profitable. And uh, now that he's a Christian, he could live up to his name. So, a useless person now being made useful. Isn't that what grace does? On a, on, on a deep level. Uh, this, whole, this whole little story here, this whole little historical account is an account of grace on a number of levels, and we ought to be sitting here reminding ourselves while we were on the slave market of sin, deserving nothing but justice, a God in his love and mercy came and rescued us. He didn't just make rescue available, he called our name in, this, in the same sense as he said, Lazarus come forth, and he brings us forth from the grave. But so Paul says in verse 12 through 14, I'm sending him back. You therefore receive him, 
that is my own heart, whom I wished to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but by voluntary. Uh, so whatever he's, uh, he, he's done wrong, he needs, he needs to go back and face the music. Um, I've had a number of occasions through the, through the years when someone has come to faith in Christ and you discover uh, there were things in the past that could be made right in the sense of going and saying, you know, when I did this or when I said this, whatever, I was wrong. It was against the Lord. It was against you. Please forgive me. Uh, on I can't think of an occasion at this point where there was a restitution involved. Uh, but this is not kin to what is prevalent in our culture today, where your great-great-great-grandparents did something, now you pay me for what they did. Uh, this is a man who is responsible for his own actions, for his own sins, and he's humbling himself under the guidance of his discipler, the Apostle Paul, to go and make it right. So, uh, the reality is, under Roman law, Philemon had every right to have Onesimus crucified. I mean, that was just, uh, there were millions of slaves in the Roman Empire. And the slave owners typically kept a very tight rein because they were always afraid of an insurrection. And so um, Roman law Im imposed very strong limits. So life or death rested with Philemon. And um, Someone's, there, there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire. And so laws against runaways were strict. If they were not crucified, a, a hot iron would be taken and marked where you would clearly know this person was a fugitive. And they've already run away once, but marked for life. And so Paul says, this guy is like my, he, we're, we're, we're heart, we're soul brothers. I know he deserves to be punished, but consider him as my own heart and be merciful to him. I wish to keep him with me. That on your behalf, he might minister to me in my chains in the gospel. Uh, if you leave Onesimus with me, It'll be like you serving me because Onesimus is your rightful servant. So it's a high appeal here. Um, he might be of great use to you, but he'd certainly be of great use to me. I'm in chains, and um, he's a blessing to me. I, I frankly need him. But I'm, I can't do anything without your approval. I want your good deed to be not forced, but voluntary. So let's, let's pull this out from that setting to uh, another level here. The Lord wants the hard places in your life and mine, the hard decisions in your life and mine, invariably they'll deal with people <laughs> much more than with stuff. Uh, but to be able to function in that out of love and not out of compulsion. Now, if all I can muster is raw obedience, hallelujah, <laughs> but to have a vision of doing what I do because it's, it's, no, it's not even close to what Jesus has done for me. Well, what trips us up? Well, we look at the failures of the other person toward whom we need to be kind or forgiving or do some sacrificial action. 
and we start thinking about how they're not worthy of it and and plus I've helped you before and and how that I know it'll be any different now and instead of just saying Lord I want to be your servant here how can I make you known how can I be a testimony of your grace and love uh, we've had the privilege here of ministering to one and it it doesn't seem like a lot of ministry now because he's mostly uh, not able to get out very much at all uh, in bad health. I'm not going to name a name at this point, but some of you will figure it out. But began in about uh, 2005. We started ministering to a person that the world has written off all of these people. Uh, they're tagged with a tag they can never change, they can never be any different, and the system reminds them of that, and if you um, move to the left or to the right in some way and we don't like it, we'll put you back in the clink. And so then to, for that individual to come to faith in Christ and to have a whole new identity, all the while in counseling being told, this is your identity. And you may have something in your past where the world, the flesh, and the devil wants to remind you that's your identity. Now, uh, hopefully this may not be your case. I think probably for many of you not, but for some of you it might be. But there, there is, for example, in the Old Testament, uh, the truth that an adulterer never loses, do you remember the word there? Uh, it it's obviously can, can be forgiven, but it never, it never goes away. It's in Proverbs chapter 6, 32 and 33. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacks understanding... He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. A wound and a dishonor shall he get, and his reproach shall not be wiped away. There's something unique about sexual sin that leaves a scar that doesn't go away. Doesn't mean you can't be forgiven. David committed adultery, David uh, committed murder was forgiven. He had consequences for the rest of his life, but he was forgiven and useful in God's kingdom. And so, but if you're not careful, you will allow something you've done in your past to be the driving force of your identity. Uh, I've known some people who committed adultery and really experienced forgiveness and were restored in great usefulness in God's kingdom and remained very humble for the rest of their lives, even to this day. And I'm thinking of an individual who was, was very active in the ministry here and committed adultery, repented, and about a year or so later was fully restored in ministry, moved away, and was put in a role of leadership in ministry, and had the privilege and the honor of helping that church do something they had never done before. He had experienced church discipline here. So now he's on the other side, helping that church to carry out church discipline on someone that the entire staff and all the deacons and everyone, this needs to be done. We've never done it. What a wonderful restoration. I've known others, though forgiven, there's a sadness and just a, a, a not, not a full recovery. And uh, I don't understand all the wherefores and whys, but uh, I'm just saying, these are deep, deep things. 
so if whether it's that or whether it's something else and and you have something in your past don't let it define you the blood of jesus is greater than that the cleansing of, and the forgiveness of god is greater than that you are in christ you are a child of god and yes this will always there'll be there'll be uh, uh things that will remind you what's the word that you use for flashbacks, flashbacks. And Paul goes on to say in verse 15 and 16, for perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but as a beloved, but rather than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more so to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Isn't this so wonderful of God that even our greatest failures uh, and, and the failures of others who have maybe wronged us, if we will respond right, God will transform not only them, but he'll transform us. Uh, Onesimus, who'd been nothing but trouble, now he's going to be the source of great blessing, not only to the Apostle Paul, but to Philemon as well. Um, the larger purpose of God. Uh, Philemon, the master, the slave master, lost a slave, but Philemon, the Christian, gained a brother and had the privilege of being involved in his restoration. That you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but a brother so uh, that's one of the uh, wonders of the New Testament and when you think about that there were 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire we don't know how many of those became Christians and were in the churches but in the church what does the scripture tell us? It's no longer bond or free, Jew or Gentile, male or female. And so uh, in, by grace, you can sit with that person and receive them as a brother, receive them as a sister. And the identity factor not being what they've done any more than what you've done, but who they are in Christ. You say, but there are people out there who uh, they're deceivers and, and they go through the motions of claiming to be transformed and then they, they go right back. Does that ever happen? Yeah. Of course. And you don't, have to, you don't have to have committed some crime. You don't have to be uh, a lifetime criminal. Um, I remember... Uh, a fellow that I met in the inner sanctums of the old prison in Nashville, you had to go up through a lot of slamming gates. They locked behind you and said, let you go deeper in. And one time he was such a good character in the prison that had him in lockdown inside this security prison. So a, a lot of doors had locked before I got to where he was. And I'll tell you what, it felt eerie. The slamming of all those gates. And, uh, well, as time went by, he made a profession of faith. We baptized him. Things seemed to be going well. And nine or ten months later, he's back on the bottle. And back the same guy he used to be. And um, I would tell people for a time, because of all of the things that happened, I said, if I've ever met anyone who had committed the unpardonable sin, maybe it was this guy. I wasn't being dogmatic, but I was, I was at a time of witnessing to him again with him screaming and yelling. He had his high-powered gun and all loaded up, and, and I had a Methodist preacher with me who was about my age and who knew karate. He was my defense, I guess, instead of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Oh dear. 
But this, I'm, I'm telling this guy that Jesus is the answer, and he's, he was screaming as loud as he could, I know, but I can't. And he started uh, hitting, we were in a, a, a building out behind the house, a stack with Chilton automotive manuals, which he sold. And he started hitting those boxes, and boxes of books started falling, and you didn't know what was going to happen. And all of a sudden, calm. Then we go into the house, and he makes his wife get up and make coffee, and, and he has a deck of cards there, and he, he tells me to pick up the deck of cards and mentally to pick one. So I shuffled them, mentally picked one, shuffled them, handed them back to him. He played around with them and pulled out the card I chose. And that's exactly what happened. Now, how it happened, I don't know. But I remember talking to the Methodist pastor on the way home. I said, do you believe in demons? He said, I didn't. <laughs> but it was a demonic, it was, it was an incredible moment and I just said, if I've ever met anybody who's crossed that line, it must be this guy. Well, I want to tell you with great joy in my heart that many years later, upon learning of his wife's being close to death because of cancer, I actually got to speak to her about a week before she died. She was clear of mind and everything. And she said, my husband still has rough edges, but he is now a Christian. And I had the privilege of talking to him. And uh, he confirmed that. Now, God knows, but I'll tell you what, it was a... Don't underestimate what God can do. And it would have been uh, tempting for Philemon uh, in a culture where you don't play around with, with escaped slaves, with fugitives. You crucify them. You, you singe their skin so everybody will know that they're a fugitive. And the Apostle Paul is saying, this guy is now profitable to me. He's now a Christian. He's your brother in Christ. I want you to receive him just like you'd receive me. And, and sometimes it's, it doesn't have to be that dramatic, but the person has done something and it hurt. And the Spirit of God is calling you to receive them. So, here's a uh, Here's a, a quote from C.H. Spurgeon, a little bit of a long quote. The transformation of the individual, by the way, this is before we get to, before we get to Spurgeon's quote. Here's a different quote. The transformation of the individual is the key to the transformation of society and the moral environment. This, the Spirit of God never had Jesus nor Paul or anyone else in the New Testament to attack the institution of slavery directly by saying this is wrong, you need to get rid of it. It was attacked by the gospel. One person at a time. And racism and whatever ism and schism is out there, uh, the answer is not uh, laws of the land. That doesn't change hearts. The gospel only, the, only the gospel changes hearts. So the transformation of the individual is the key to the transformation of society and the moral involved, environment. Here's what Spurgeon said. But mark this word, the true transforming of the drunkard lies in giving him a new heart. The true reclaiming of the harlot is to be found in a new nature. I see certain of my brethren fiddling away at the branches of the tree of vice with their wooden saws. But as for the gospel, it lays the axe to the roots of the whole forest of evil, and if it be fairly received into the heart, it fells all the bad trees at once. And instead of them, there spring up the fir tree, the pine tree, the box tree together, to beautify the house of our master's glory. Well, reading that quote reminded me of 1 Corinthians 6. He says, you know, if your lifestyle is, you know, drunkenness and immorality and 
being a thief and being a glutton and all this, uh, I've told you before, I'm telling you again, you won't be in the kingdom of heaven. And such were some of you, but you're transformed. And that's the power of the gospel. And uh, sometimes there's so many things going on in our culture today, and, and so many false things, and we feel like, well, I'm just a little Christian, and we're just a little small congregation. What can we do? We can live out the gospel and see the, see the Lord transform people one at a time. And it makes an eternity, makes a difference for eternity. So then he says in verse 17 to 19, If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would receive me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. So this sounds like uh, what the Lord has done for us, doesn't it? <laughs> Paul is saying, hey, I know this guy's a criminal. He deserves punishment, yet he, he is my friend. He is now my brother in Christ. And frankly, to punish him is to punish me. I stand beside him. Whatever he owes you, I'll take it. I'll pay it. Whatever he owes you, put that to my account. Paul said, I preach repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We owe holy God everything, and we have nothing which with to pay. We deserve nothing but his justice and his judgment. And Jesus says, put that to my account. Hallelujah, what a Savior. All the more motivation for you and I to go out into our world in a fresh way today with a spirit of humility and amazement at God's grace to us and a readiness to take something that's maybe dumped on us and not be knocked down by it but to say Lord I'm going to serve that person I'm going to minister the gospel to that person. I'm going to share the Lord with him. Charge the wrong of Onesimus to my account. Martin Luther said, here we see how Paul lays himself out for Onesimus and with all of his means pleads his cause with his master and so sets himself as if he were Onesimus and had himself done wrong to Philemon. Even as Christ did for us with God the Father, thus also does Paul for Onesimus with Philemon. Not to mention that you owe me even your own self. I've got a lot of credit. And um, let that motivate you in your decision, Philemon. Verse 20 through 22, yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord, having confidence in your obedience. I write you knowing that you will do even more than I say. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me, and I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. Let me have the joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord, he started out. And he sent this whole thing. What, what a wonderful thing that Paul could write this letter, and he knew when he wrote it. He knew the depth of character of Philemon that he would receive the letter. And may there be such growth and grace in our lives when someone needs to come to us with something. They'll have an inward assurance this brother knows the Lord, loves the Lord. He'll do right. Refresh my heart. Prepare a guest room. They're close, close friends. Again, uh, Paul believed that it would be through the prayers of Philemon that they would be brought together again. And so then he ends the little epistle with uh, 
some words about some of the fellow laborers. And then he says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So Paul never tried to overthrow the system of slavery. And yet the principles of the letter to Philemon destroy slavery. Uh, and destroy slavery to sin of any description. The greatest social changes come when people are changed, not when new laws are made. There has to be heart change. I'm not saying that there's not a place for good laws, but the thing that will make the difference is when there's heart change. Any final questions or thoughts? All right. Father, we bless you for the wonderful letter that you've preserved for us and that you have the glorious gospel uh, shining forth from it, not only from the Apostle Paul, but from Philemon and from Onesimus, people who were at very different stations of life, but the same gospel of grace transform them all. And we thank you that you continue to do that. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless.